Kreimer, and I am the proud cellist of this bluegrass band behind me called Cisco and the Race Cars. And you might be thinking it's weird to have a cello in a bluegrass band, and you'd be correct. It's pretty unusual. I didn't always play this type of music. For most of my life, I sounded more like this. So I'll tell you what happened. Back in the winter of 2013, I had just moved to Arizona from Michigan and I didn't know anybody. I was a first year teacher teaching ninth grade humanities at a small charter school and I was doing the best that I could. I was waking up early, working hard, and learning about that incredible combination of grace and tenacity that it takes to be a good teacher. And on the surface, it looked like I was doing really well. But in my heart, I knew that I was not well. I felt incredibly lonely and isolated, and I didn't have much of a sense of purpose other than just trying to make it through each day. This was quite different from the environment I was used to. I started playing the cello when I was six, and looking back, music was the common thread that wove together all of my most important childhood experiences. I met all of my best friends through the orchestras and quartets that I played in, and practicing gave me a sense of purpose and success. In college, I went in, on to study music and liberal arts, and in both disciplines, I found beauty, inspiration, and once again, tight-knit communities. So compare that sense of belonging to the isolation I felt when I moved across the country for a job for which I felt ill-prepared, and I had this horrible feeling that I had made a huge mistake with my life. This is where Craigslist comes in. <laughs> Around this time, winter break of my first year teaching, I happened to watch a documentary called Craigslist Joe, in which a happy-go-lucky guy named Joe travels across the country, relying solely on the goodness of strangers he meets on Craigslist. This gave me an idea. I hadn't picked up my cello in six months, and I craved that community I had always known through music. So I thought I might accomplish two tasks in one, and I looked for musical opportunities on Craigslist. I thought I might find a quartet or a piano trio, but at the time, the only posting for a cellist in the Phoenix area was from someone named Francisco, who had a bluegrass band. Now, it's a testament to Francisco's boldness that he wanted to include a cello in his band at all. It's a concept at which bluegrass purists would scoff. I, on the other hand, had no idea what bluegrass music was, other than having seen O Brother or Art Thou a few years earlier. <laughs> Still, I thought it was worth a shot, and so Francisco and I exchanged contact information, and he invited me to practice with the band the next weekend. So on a rainy Saturday afternoon, I found myself standing on a front porch of a house in Chandler. And as I stood on the front porch, I hesitated, and I listened through the front door, and I heard something like this. It was too late to turn back. <laughs> so I knocked on the door, and I entered. And the house was very interesting inside. There were photographs covering every wall of people from all ages and backgrounds, and there were instruments everywhere, and child-sized furniture, and teacups, and snacks, and it looked like this strange combination of a living room and a community center. And I now know that this home belongs to Mrs. Annie Beach, who does in fact run a children's music group out of her living room, and has become a dear friend and mentor. At the time, I just knew it was one of those places that feels familiar even though you've never been there before. So feeling slightly more at ease, I took out my cello and got ready to play the first song. And I looked around for the sheet music, only to realize with horror that there was no sheet music. <laughs> and I had no idea what to do. I felt like a six-year-old picking up a cello again for the first time, but instead of excitement and anticipation, I felt only dread. I was so worried about making a fool of myself in front of these strangers, and I felt the anxiety rising hot and fast in my stomach. 
Still, I felt that sitting there immobile was even worse than playing poorly, and so I listened to what the other musicians were playing for about a minute, and then I picked out a very simple bass line, and through trial and error, I found notes that harmonized with theirs. It sounded something like this. <laughs> First practice was both exhilarating and terrifying, but I came back again the next week and the week after that because I wanted to get better. Um, and in particular, I wanted to learn how to play what I heard my fellow musicians playing, which was generally rhythmic and quite fast. So I learned a bluegrass technique called the chop. Sounds like this. <laughs> Chop gave me another tool to use when I was learning um, my part in a song, but I still wasn't satisfied. I also learned the melodies of the tunes we played, and then slowly I began to improvise on those melodies, creating variations that sometimes worked and sometimes didn't. Here is a melody and some improvisation that hopefully works. <laughs> and often frustrating to learn these new styles, but in doing so, I became more open and vulnerable around my bandmates and more willing to show them my mistakes. It would be months before I realized I had found my community. It happened slowly, almost without my realizing, and then one day I looked around and I knew that my bandmates had become some of my best friends. And Chester, that mandolin player you heard, he and I became more than friends, and he proposed to me in Mrs. Beach's living room four years after we had our first rehearsal. <laughs> This past summer, our community expanded even further, across the ocean. Our band had the opportunity to travel to Ukraine on a musical diplomacy mission with the Peace Corps. It was an opportunity that seemed to fall on us out of the sky, and initially, some of us, namely me, were a bit skeptical. <laughs> but as a group, we decided to take the journey together. And for me, the defining moment came one night when we were playing an outdoor concert in a town called Khmelnytsky and it was a show built as a jam session with local musicians. And I found myself playing a duet on My Way by Frank Sinatra with the most incredible saxophone player I've ever heard. It was an unlikely song and an even more unlikely combination of instruments, and we couldn't have spoken two words in each other's language, but somehow we understood each other on an intuitive musical level. Later that night, I was still exhilarated with the experience and I was reflecting on all of the decisions that had brought me to that point. My decision long ago to pick up a cello and to continue studying music through my life, my decision which I initially regretted to move to Arizona, uh, my unlikely decision to seek music and friends on Craigslist, <laughs> the band's decision to accept me and our shared decision to travel to Ukraine together, and finally that night, my decision to step forward on stage and improvise a duet with a saxophone player whose language I couldn't speak. I don't believe in fate, but I do believe that every once in a while, we make the decision to show up at just the right time and just the right place. That's what brings me here tonight. I started this journey because I was seeking a cure for my loneliness, and it took me to people and places I needed desperately, even though I couldn't have articulated it at the time. A very wise friend once advised me, look fear in the eye and make it your friend. So as I conclude, I ask you, what is something you've wanted to show up to but have avoided because of fear of the uncomfortable or the unknown? Now, what would it feel like to embrace that fear and show up anyway? I promise you'll find something you needed to find. Thank you. <laughs>